for a certain period of time, the major figures through which the globalization was have been symbolized was the tourist. And listen, the tourist comes, he smiles, he spends, he goes back. And he's not bordering anybody with his own problems. In a certain way, he comes and he so much admires what he sees. And here in Barcelona, of course, you're experts on seeing tourists. Uh, and this is how globalization worked. And then suddenly, this same person comes as a refugee. He comes, he stays because there is no way back to go. And then basically he's not spending, but you're not spending on him. Uh, and it's not simply the money, but the fact that all kind of a difficulty of the world he's coming from is basically entering uh, also your life. I'm saying this because my first argument is going to be a very simple one. In the last decade, European Union was dancing with a different crisis. And I do believe that out of the four crises that European Union has been experiencing in this decade, I mean the financial crisis, the crisis of the euro in the 2011-12, and then you have the Russia-Ukrainian crisis, and then Brexit, I do believe that the refugee crisis is going to have the strongest impact on the domestic politics of countries, including countries in which you don't have a single refugee. And this is what I'll try to, uh, to present to you. Paradoxically, I do believe that the impact of the refugee crisis can be compared to is the impact of the 9-11 on the American psyche. Because at the end of the day, it was a tragic event. 3,000 people died. But compared to how many people are dying in the world, it was not the number of the people who died. It was that overnight, Americans see the world in which they are living differently. And I do believe this is my first argument. The most important impact of the refugee crisis of 2015 is the change of the political imagination of Europeans. But you're going to, coming from where I'm coming, trying to argue why you have such a major impact of the refugee crisis in a countries like Eastern Europe where you do not have refugees. Just to give you an example, what I'm talking about, in the same year 2015, when the Germans basically received around 1 million people, there are 168 people who asked for asylum in Slovakia. And eight people got it. And nevertheless, the migration became the major political issue on the agenda. Because of a migration, a far-right party entered the parliament. It changed the position of all parties. Why this is where it comes from? Why basically migration became so critically important? First, probably, you know that the most important factor that defines how much money you're going to have in your life is not your education. It's not even the education of your parents, but this is basically where you're born. There is a very beautiful book called Birthplace Lottery. One of the things that globalization produced, and which I do believe is not discussed enough, is that it is totally changing the frame of comparisons. Before you're comparing yourself with your neighbor on the level of how well you're living and so on, or for example, a Bulgarian doctor is going to compare himself with a Bulgarian teacher. Suddenly, because of the fact that you have so much information about other places of the world, Bulgarian doctors started to compare their lives and their incomes with the German doctors. And nevertheless, that probably their income has very much increased in the last years, and probably they're doing much better than the Bulgarian teachers. They have been unhappy. But the major result of the fact that there is so much social inequality in the world, not simply within societies, but between societies, and because of the fact that people now know very much how others lived, one important thing has changed. If you want radically to change your life, it does not make so much sense to change your government if you're living in one of these poor and basically badly run countries. Better to change the country in which you live. Migration is the 21st century revolution, but it's a very strange revolution. It does not need ideology. You don't need political party. Nobody is going to write communist manifesto. And strangely enough, you do not need other people. It's just you, your family, your mobile phone. And basically, you can try to make this, by the way, very risky and radical decision to change. I'm saying this because of the nature of this revolution. Europe suddenly 
ended up being as a counter-revolutionary force. Because many of these people who want to leave, they want to come here. Not that many of them are here. And by the way, this is something quite important. I'm going to talk a lot about the migration crisis, but as I told you, in my view, this crisis is very much also in the political imagination of European citizens and governments. If you talk about numbers, always keep in mind that there are more Syrian refugees in Turkey than the European Union as a whole. I do believe that the migration crisis should be perceived not simply as the flow of people coming, but it's also the migration of voters. There is a huge number of voters who till yesterday have been voting for the center left in Europe. As a result of the migration crisis, they voted on the far right. Border between left and right, which was so clear, uh, during the Cold War years now is very much blurred. And this is not simply that voters emigrated, arguments emigrating. In the 1970s, a kind of a well-educated leftist is going to tell you that nobody has the right to impose ways of life on the rural communities in India, and then these communities has the right to defend their way of life. But now this is a very rich middle-class communities in Western Europe who said, listen, what about us? Do we have the right to defend our way of life? The same argument which was basically used in a different way in the 1970s is now totally differently used now. And as a result of it, we started to have this uh, rise of the populist parties. And it's quite important because the word populism is totally misused. Basically, there are certain words which, if they are going to be banned, I do believe that they are going to clarify our thinking because now everybody, when you want to insult somebody, is going to use the populist uh, uh, term. But we're talking about something quite important. And what we're talking is about political parties who are not anti-democratic, nevertheless they are anti-liberal, but who believe that the major uh, job of the democratic institutions is to guarantee the rights of the majorities. Let's put it like this. It's not true that we see the rise of identity politics now. Identity politics has been around. In 1990s, you have a lot of identity politics. The difference was that in 1990s, identity politics was perceived very much as the politics of the minorities. And now it became the politics of the majorities. And this is where the major change comes from. Migration is the one rewriting the rules of political behavior and political identity. And from here, I'll go back to the basically East-West divide. But what people don't understand, in my view, and this is one thing that I do believe I very much want to see how you view this is, what people didn't understand is that the migration crisis triggered the demographic fears of the small nations. This is part of the problem with the small nations. And this was always very much present they're not sure in their very existence. And this is why this crisis triggered a very deep metaphysical fears that existed there. You should try to imagine the impact and the trauma of the people who left Central and Eastern Europe for the last 25 years. Just to give you some data, in the last 10 years, more than 10% of the population of the Baltic countries has left. The very fact that others are leaving, and some of these others are younger, some of them quite energetic and so on, it's not about, is making the very fact that you're staying to look like a loss, like, like a failure. People leaving are devaluating the place in which you're working. I do believe for those of you, I'm coming, I was born in a, uh, in a rural area, and people who have the memories of the way people move from the villages to the cities in the 60s and 70s know very well this experience. Basically, the very fact that young people are living, nobody is here, makes you try to see your life in a much more negative perspective. And I do believe this is one of the things that happened to Central and Eastern Europe. Nevertheless, that in economic terms, it's different from the country to country, but some countries are doing very well, Poland being very much one of them. Uh, but then basically you have the feeling that it cannot be good if everybody is living. The migration crisis is not about two or three million people coming. It's even not the fact, nevertheless, that it's quite important that people had the feeling that situation is out of control and you don't know how it's going to happen and what is going to happen. It's very much about this important feeling that you don't understand anymore 
the place in which you are living, the world in which you are living, that I do believe we're in a critical moment in which certain period has ended and the new one is starting. The period, at least, that our generation very much experienced after the end of the Cold War. The key word was recognition. And as I told you, there was an identity politic, but it was very much the identity politics of the minorities, any type of minorities. It was the identity politics of sexual minorities, of ethnic, of religious minorities. And their major argument was, listen, we want to be treated as equal, but keep in mind that we are different. And in English, the very word recognition tells you very much about this. You recognize a face. I can recognize who you are. I can distinguish you from the others. In recognition, the talk of power is not very much present. I want to be recognized, not because I am strong, but because I do believe that I have certain rights. The demand for respect is we are equal, but don't forget, there are majorities and minorities. They're strong and weak. I do believe from this kind of a move from identity politics centered on minorities, where everybody pretends that we are one or the other minorities, we are moving to a basically politics where majorities uh, are trying to insert their identity politics. This is going to change our democracies, and for sure this is going to be a major challenge uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the European Union. As we used to say in the Balkans in the 1990s, why to be minority in your own country when you can be minority in mine? Thank you very much.